Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So I want to start a little mini series today on uh, Intel's latest SIMD instruction set, AVX512. So it's not yet become clear whether AMD will adopt AVX512. So this is just Intel centric at the moment. We're going to do three videos in this mini series. The first one, this one, will just be a general introduction to SIMD and then uh, a a little bit about the AVX512 instruction sets, just so that you get a broad overview. The second video, we're gonna show uh, coding in three different ways so that you can add uh, AVX512 to your own projects if you want. And then the third video, we're gonna have a bit of a deep dive into the mechanisms that make up uh, AVX512. Because I tell you what, uh, there's a lot more to this instruction set than, than just a doubling of the register size. AVX512 is a SIMD instruction set with 512-bit uh, registers. It was added by Intel to the x86-64 CPUs. At the moment, it's not supported by AMD and there is no word. So it's October 2020. There's no word as to whether or not AMD will actually include AVX512 or not. We're sort of seeing something really, really interesting happen right now in the world of CPUs. AMD is going for lots and lots of cores in their Ryzen CPUs for uh, parallelism. And Intel is going for a massive instruction set. Who's gonna win? Who knows? What an interesting battle. Alrighty, AVX512 is a SIMD instruction set, is it? That's good. What's SIMD? <laughs> SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. I kid you not. SIMD is a type of parallelism. It's just like multi-core, except it's a different type of parallelism. What you find when you look at the way a modern CPU works, uh, it's really extremely important that they achieve parallelism. It's what gives most of the speed to modern uh, CPUs. Nowadays, instead of making CPUs run faster and faster, up to say five gigahertz or, or seven gigahertz or whatever, that core clock speed increase actually slowed down and stopped. So instead of adding extra speed to CPUs, what the manufacturers decided to do was add more parallelism. So if you add more parallelism, then the CPUs can execute more instructions at once but you don't necessarily have to pump up that clock speed higher and higher. The gains on pumping up that clock speed higher and higher are just not worth it. I don't know if you've seen this, but these um, overclockers, <laughs> they're a funny bunch. They're absolute class. Um, what they do, they put uh, liquid nitrogen just directly on the CPU. They just pour it on the CPU to try and cool it down so that they can overclock their CPU to seven gigahertz or whatever. All right, so we can't increase the clock speed indefinitely. Uh, it really hits a bit of a wall and we hit that wall, you know, back in 2010 or, or probably even before then, really. The, the core clock speed, is, it sort of levels out at around, I don't know, three or four gigahertz generally. So in order to keep gaining speed, what CPU manufacturers did was they started to introduce more and more parallelism. So what you get is that all of these different levels of parallelism in a modern CPU and it's that which makes modern CPUs so much faster at number crunching than uh, older hardware. So multi-core, this, uh, this is AMD's strategy at the moment. They're going with, uh, with multi-core. Multi-core CPUs contain uh, multiple execution units on the die. So you've, you've essentially got more than one CPU in your system and the different cores can execute completely different unrelated code at the same time. One of your cores might be doing some, some background task for Windows and one of your cores might be playing some, some song or something that you've got on some playlist somewhere. The more cores that you add, you can process more and more different uh, applications or, or data at once. SIMD is less flexible than multi-core, generally speaking, but it's often much faster. Instead of having multiple execution units which can execute completely different and unrelated code, in SIMD, what we do is we execute the same instruction on a bunch of different data. Yeah, so, so single instruction, multiple data. It's a type of parallelism. I think there's a thing called uh, Flynn's taxonomy, if you want to look up taxonomies by Flynn. <laughs> All right, both AMD and Intel have extensive SIMD instruction sets. Yeah, I don't want you to think that uh, AMD CPUs don't do any SIMD. They do a lot of SIMD. Uh, it's only the latest instruction set, this AVX512, that AMD is yet to adopt, if they'll adopt it at all. Okay, so let's move on now to talk about AVX512 itself. So AVX512 is actually named after the vector register size. 
which is 512 bits wide. The previous instruction sets, your AVX1 and AVX2, were actually 256 bits wide. And before that, we had a bunch of SSE instruction sets or streaming SIMD instruction sets. And they dealt with vectors of 128 bits wide. Uh, then there was MMX before that was 64 bits. So what you see is that the vector register size is doubling each time we get these massive generational leaps. So we started with uh, MMX, which was 64 bits wide. Then we moved up to SSE instruction sets, which were 128 bits wide. Then we got to AVX 1 and 2 uh, back in Sandy Bridge. And uh, what was it, Bulldozer? Yeah, so that was uh, 256 bits wide. And nowadays, in AVX 512, uh, Intel has graciously decided to double the vector register size again to 512 bits. Absolutely extraordinary amount of data. <laughs> Those 512 bits of these vector registers can be used as lots of different sorts of data. Yeah, okay, so you see just here this chart of the different data types that these 512 bit vectors can, can actually uh, represent. Um, it's just, it's absolutely amazing to think that a CPU could perform 64 byte operations in less than a clock cycle. If you're processing strings or something, this instruction set is extraordinary. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You can do 32 operations on short integers or words at once. You could do 16 operations on D words, eight operations on Q words or 64 bit integers, long, long in C++ parlance, 16 operations on floats or single precision floats, and eight operations on doubles. I mean, just the processing power of this instruction set is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I will say that uh, for, for floating point, the throughput is not great. So it tends to perform, uh, I would say, only marginally better, maybe 10, 15% better than uh, AVX, that floating point. Uh, but uh, AVX 512 is just, it's absolutely amazing at uh, processing integers. Really, really good. That's really where it shines. All right, so the vector size was increased to a completely ridiculous 512 bits. Another change was that we got 32 registers as opposed to the uh, original 16. So for the longest time, there's been uh, only 16 SIMD registers in CPUs. The new registers are called ZMM0 all the way up to ZMM31. Not only have we got 32 of these ZMM registers, but because the SSE and the AVX registers are all aliased together, we actually get 32 uh, X MM registers and 32 Y MM registers as well. AVX 512 also introduces eight mask registers. So these are for branchless programming or setting up something like predicates, uh, which are used on, uh, on GPUs extensively. The idea here is that you can supply a, a bit mask of ones and zeros, and then whatever operation you perform will only be saved to the elements of the registers which correspond to ones in the bit mask. The registers are called K0 to K7, uh, so there's eight of them, and they're all 64 bits wide. AVX 512 offers automatic broadcasting from memory in many instructions. Yeah, I tell ya, why did we not have this? <laughs> why did we not have this for 10 years? To broadcast is to read one value and to copy it to all of the elements of a register. That's called a broadcast. It's, it's quite a common thing that you would uh, read some value into a vector register, then broadcast it, and then perform some operation using that value. AVX 512 actually offers the ability to automatically uh, read and broadcast. AVX 512 also offers rounding control yeah, this is, this is a strange one, but often you set the rounding mode used by all instructions in a register called MXCSR, but in AVX 512, we actually have the option for a lot of instructions to include the rounding mode explicitly in the instruction, which is really interesting because it, uh, it means that you can actually switch rounding modes on a per instruction basis. Okay, so the final interesting mechanism that AVX 512 offers is what's called compressed displacement. Uh, so this is fascinating. This is um, really low level, and this actually is handled pretty much by the assembler or the compiler itself. If you've got a displacement in your instructions, and the displacement is uh, a multiple of the vector size, as they often are, then uh, AVX 512 has this really interesting uh, ability to uh, write that displacement in a really compressed, uh, a small way, and save some bytes in the, in the code.
It's very low level stuff. And, and generally, uh, from the programmer's point of view, it's, it's automatic. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it. All of these things are supported by the new EVEX encoding scheme, allowing a massive number of new instructions, upgrades to old instructions, and some really amazing flexibility. Okay, so let's move on and have a brief overview of the AVX 512 instruction sets themselves. So AVX 512 is really just a generic term for a bunch of smaller instruction sets that uh, Intel has added in a kind of modular way. A CPU is said to be AVX 512 capable uh, if the foundation instruction set is included. The Ice Lake CPUs or 10th gen CPUs can actually do a whole lot of these instruction sets. There's a couple of missing at the end which uh, Tiger Lake, I think, will introduce, but we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, so I'm gonna include the CPU ID flags just for those playing along at home. <laughs> Dave, you're a legend. <laughs> I've included the CPU flags for the instruction sets. Yeah, so CPU ID is used by programmers so that their applications can detect in the hardware uh, at runtime which, uh, which um, instruction sets the hardware is capable of. All right, but here are the smaller modular instruction sets themselves. So beginning with generation one, Knight's Landing, uh, F, the foundation instruction set. So this included most of the 32 and 64 bit AVX instructions upgraded to 512 bits. It also introduced the K masks and the rounding control. CPU ID flag is EBX 16. Conflict detection was also added in Knight's Landing and this was designed to detect duplicate values. We also got several K mask broadcasting instructions as well as counting the leading zeros. Yeah, it's interesting just how many bit manipulation instructions have come along. So that was CD, the conflict detection instruction set, EBX28 there. Then we've got exponential and reciprocal instruction set or ER. The uh, ER instruction set, obviously it computes um, exponentials and reciprocals. It's actually really, really fast, but they are approximations. Uh, I will say they're very good approximations, really good approximations, uh, actually better than the uh, SSE reciprocal instructions. EBX27 is what you're after there. Uh, PF, the prefetch instruction. So sparse prefetching, this is fascinating stuff. I tell you what, if we could, if we could get a hold of RAM in a sparse way, fast, so many problems would be solved. I think this is a good step towards that. Yeah, gather and scatter instructions are difficult to introduce in a fast way, but PF, the prefetch instructions, EBX26. Generation two, Canon Lake. Okay, so we got a whole bunch of different uh, instruction sets in Canon Lake as well. Starting with VL, the vector length extensions. This adds AVX512 functionality to the AVX and SSE registers. VL, or vector length extensions. EBX31, if you want a CPU ID, that bad boy. Uh, the next one, D, ooh, double and quad word, or DQ. This adds new instructions for D words and quad words. We've got uh, EBX17 is the CPU ID flag. Then we've got BW, which is operations for bytes and words. And that's EBX30, if you want a CPU ID, that one. Then we've got fused multiply and add. Who doesn't like a fused multiply and add? I tell you what, these have become some of the most useful instructions out there. They are number crunching fiends, these uh, FMAD instructions. EBX21, if you want to FMAD something and you don't know if your machine's capable. Moving along, VBMI, vector bit manipulation instructions. Um, there's some very, very powerful bit manipulation operations in this instruction set. I mean, just next level. Uh, ternary logic, anyone. Uh, ECX1 is the bit that you want to check there. Okay, generation three, Knight's Mill. We got neural net instructions for words. I'll say that they're actually useful outside of neural nets. I mean, they're fairly generic, but certainly neural nets is a good way to use them. And I guess um, just because neural net is such a buzzword, Intel decided to use it for this instruction set. But EDX2 is the uh, CPU ID flag. 4F maps, these names are getting crazy. Fused multiply and add. So this is another fused multiply and add instruction set. Um, this one's for floating point, EDX3 is the flag for that one. Generation four, Ice Lake. So the CPU that we'll be actually coding is, is an Ice Lake CPU. Ice Lake is 10th gen. All right, we've got uh, V pop count or population count. This is an interesting instruction. It's, it's hard to imagine why this wasn't included um, much earlier, but 
A vectorized population count counts the number of ones in each of the elements of your vectors. Then we've got some more neural net instructions. This is V, N, and I. These are multiply and accumulate instructions for bytes and words. Really useful for the type of maths that you do with neural nets. This is uh, basically matrix multiplication. The CPU ID flag is ECX11. So one set of BMI instructions was not enough. We want to manipulate more bits. <laughs> So we've also got VBMI2, Vector Bit Manipulation Instructions 2. All right, so this is about a bunch of sparse stores and loads and some concatenates and some, some shift instructions. I actually don't know why it was so difficult to include that. Yeah, but just barrel shifters seem to be very difficult to include. But anyway, whatever. Uh, try making a CPU sometime, Creel. You're full of talk, mate. <laughs> Bit alg. All right, so this is the final of the Ice Lake uh, bit algorithms. So the bit alg instruction set uh, contains a bunch of population counts and some bitwise shuffle instructions. And ECX12 is the flag. Generation five is Tiger Lake. And we've got just one little instruction set there. And that's called VP2 intersect vector pair intersection. I'm not really sure what it does, uh, but I'll find out when uh, we get Tiger Lake CPUs. Uh, which will be the 11th gen. EDX8 is the CPU ID flag. Okay, so what is AVX512? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a SIMD instruction set. It's an absolutely gigantic leap forward in terms of instruction sets. And um, only time will tell if uh, AMD will adopt it or just continue to add more cores to their Ryzen CPUs. Uh, only time will tell also if the upcoming Tiger Lake CPUs can uh, do something about the throughput of the floating point in uh, AVX 512. Uh, it's an interesting time, really. It's a really, really interesting time. Anyway, in the next video, we're going to be looking at three different ways that you can actually program for AVX 512 CPUs. Yeah, so I hope that'll be interesting. And uh, I hope this was interesting as well, just as a broad overview of what AVX 512 is. Yeah, and I reckon that's about it. So uh, I hope you have a really good day and cheers for watching. This first one just here is the MMX register set. I just put this in for laughs. I don't want to laugh at it. I want to laugh with it. It's the cutest little instruction set in the whole world. And I do hope that Intel doesn't get rid of it. They were making it really slow for a while, but I love it. Don't get rid of it. It's funny.